Thank you, Mr. Minister. We are very proud to have you here. It's the first time that the Women's Forum is present here in Rome. Uh, you know that it is the 60th anniversary of the Traité de Rome. And having here in Le Villa Medicis you present to say how much the women care for Europe and how Europe is important for women. And your presence here means a lot for you. So thank you. And I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Good evening to everybody. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. It's also a very welcome uh, interruption in the daily routine of a minister. Uh, so thank you also for that reason. I thought I'd uh, share my time with you uh, sharing a few thoughts on, uh, on global issues and European and the role that Europe can play in those global issues in these difficult times, but also uh, suggesting how gender issues can be introduced, not only introduced, but also play a leading role in the debate about international cooperation. So international cooperation, let me start with, uh, with what I think to be the obvious, is not living healthy times. Uh, and I think it's the duty of policymakers, but also informed people and organizations and NGOs to ask what should we expect and what can we do to improve collaboration in a number of areas and irrespective of the areas because of course achieving cooperation per se is something which strengthens international, the international texture of, of global relations. Um, back several decades ago when I was a young scholar uh, one of the leading ideas about international cooperation is that international cooperation could be achieved best in a situation which scholars refer to as the hegemonic structure of the global system. By that meaning that there is one country, an hegemon, which provides support, wealth, security, open trade, financial stability to the rest of the world. And so the other countries could enjoy those public goods, as the economists call them, ignoring everything else, almost everything else. The world has deeply evolved since then, and now we are no more in an oligopolist, in a hegemonic situation. We are in a situation in which several countries are large enough to influence the global uh, framework, but not large enough to play the role of hegemons. So you are forced, we are forced, to find an agreement, which is, of course, the more difficult, the more uh, major players disagree on the final goals of the international system. So my point is uh, simply stated in its, uh, in its uh, simple terms. Uh, we need to find international cooperation achievements in a more difficult environment, but we should not despair. I'd rather be more optimistic than is often uh, um, considered when looking at international cooperation. I think that the international system is more resilient than sometimes is referred to in spite of attitudes by some key players that would uh, suggest the opposite. And number one, number two, that Europe exactly now can and should play a more proactive role in providing international cooperation because it's facing good opportunities. Number three, international cooperation must be consistent with domestic policy goals. And therefore, to achieve stronger cooperation today, there is a way to uh, redefine public policy agendas within countries that are both improving the level of welfare within countries, but also improving the chances of achieving cooperation. So I put a number of things on the table. Let me try to give some uh, explanatory uh, words to what I mean. First of all, a, a world where the several big players. Now, it seems to me obvious that Europe should be one of those players. And it has not been the case for, such, uh, for a long time in that effect. But now is the time with which Europe can exploit 
the situation and become a big global player. Why is the time now? Because we are a bit more optimistic nowadays with respect to, say, a year ago, uh, with respect to the fact that Europe, the European uh, message, the European idea and European policy can provide better responses to what citizens' needs are addressed to and what in lack of responses would lead to what are referred to as populist responses. So populism is still al uh, alive and kicking in many countries, including this country. But maybe, uh, especially after uh, President Macron's election, there is a strong message which says you can win the elections, beat the populist with a European message. So this is, I think, a first point to start from. A very strong political point, which exactly because it's strong, it should be generalized and adopted as a method of work. So European countries and governments have a duty to explore how to improve, upgrade, and, and first to further develop the European policy strategy to, uh, to win the elections, which of course is important in democracy, but also to provide uh, a, a contribution to global cooperation. Second point about Europe is that Europe now needs to provide what in the policy debate is referred to as European public goods. What, the, what do I mean by that? Well, think of very concrete challenges. Security, migration, employment or the opposite, unemployment and growth. All of these elements which, if not addressed, would lead to more populist responses and to more adverse scenarios, require a European response. So Europe needs to play a, a larger role in the global economy, not only because we need cooperation and European responses, but because we need new European responses, and that's my second point, to challenges which have emerged very strongly over the recent past. And Europe is not doing enough. Again, this country, but not to uh, play out the, the blaming game, this country, as you all know, is uh, facing frontline challenges in migration issues, which are migration issues uh, referring to European migration policy, which is not there. So we in Europe need to agree a common uh, migration policy, not because some countries are suffering more than others, but because this is a truly European challenge, especially if migration has to be an integration story and not a disintegration story. <clears throat> this story, uh, which is necessary at the European level, can be further developed at the global level. And here, uh, I would like to share with you very, very quickly the experience that Italy as G7 chair has been uh, following through. Uh, we had a G7 finance ministers meeting in Bari in May. At the time in which the uh, leading power in the world was already showing disenchantment with international cooperation and quite the contrary with stating out very clearly that some issues such as trade or environment should not be on the agenda. This is very negative for two reasons. One, for their own sake. We need a global trade policy. We need a global environment policy, but also for its policy, political message. Uh, anyone that would stay I don't want common trade approaches, I don't want common environment approaches, by definition says, I will follow my own national approaches to these issues, which will not go away just because you say they're not there. So there is an important challenge in the method and approach of international policy that needs to be rebuked. And what was uh, obtained in Bari, I'm not claiming big success, but I'm claiming that there are cases in which this situation could be addressed. We, the G7 countries, agreed on a number of issues which may not be as 
headline breaking such as environment or trade, but at least as important. Let me give you a couple of examples. Cyber security, or fighting against terrorism and exchanging information about terrorism, or redesigning the development bank structure at the global level, or enhancing tax cooperation. These are all very boring issues, I understand, but these are the usual boring issues finance ministers have to deal with. Uh, and, they, uh, and if we look at these issues, we look at the actual implementation of policies, of agreed and common and shared policies on these areas, we find, we find much more cooperation and much more collective action than often is referred to. So, of course, saying no to the environment agreement, to the Paris agreement, makes a big splash in communication. And, of course, saying that there is progress in cybersecurity does not make a big splash. So it has a different visibility aspect. But the fact that there is agreement among the G7, and in some cases extending it to the G20 on these issues, is encouraging. This is why I'm moderately optimistic, because there are areas in which, in spite of the new situation globally, all countries involved, including the leading economic power, are prepared to uh, follow common policies in practice to achieve security and, and uh, fair taxation, which are, again, examples of international public goods, examples of an international agreement on rules and behavior. Among the, uh, among the um, elements which were discussed in Bari and are being discussed also in the G20 agenda, is inclusive growth. Now, this is something extremely important which allows me to move quickly towards the role of gender policies in, 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 my, in my remarks. Um, I considered a, a remarkable achievement the fact that nowadays in international fora and international meetings such as the G7 and the G20, there is unchallenged agreement that growth should not be just strong but also inclusive, meaning that no one should be left behind and that contrary to what often is believed, inequality is bad on its own sake and it's also bad for growth itself. So there are economic policy recipes and strategies which should and can reconcile growth employment, inclusiveness, and, and this is where I come to, to my final point, gender issues. Of course, when we, we, we put inequality on the table, gender-related inequalities are very relevant. They are widespread, they are very pervasive in some cases, and they are a burden when there is inequality or gender separation. Very, uh, very much a burden of growth. So, one element which also adds to my moderate optimism is that, that there is at least uh, lip service agreement on the fact that uh, growth policies pursued by the finance ministers, by the leaders, should be inclusive. And this inclusion, this is the point I want to arrive to, it must by definition include gender policies. So this is one other element which adds to my little list of reasons to be optimistic about international cooperation. Let me come to my final point and also share with you uh, an example of what national governments can do in this environment. I've talked about uh, some aspects of international collaboration, examples of international collaboration, but we all know by historical evidence that simply agreeing on common policies and implementing agreed treaties is not enough to achieve a stable global system. What needs to be added to that dimension is the national dimension, meaning by that that national policies, social and economic and the like, must be consistent with the goals uh, established and agreed upon at the international level. So the point is very simple. If there is agreement at the international level that growth must be inclusive, then there must be 
an inclusive strategy at home so that there is no conf contradiction between what is decided at the international level and what is decided at the national level. And here, you will excuse me if I uh, offer a little advertisement about what the Italian government has been doing with these issues. And the Italian government has uh, uh, introduced exactly this year two elements which are consistent with having inclusive growth in practice and not just as a statement and it, having inclusive growth at the national level. Uh, we have introduced first of all, well the first element of how what is, need, or what is needed when you decide to shift your policy emphasis. The first, emph the first element on, on any policy strategy must be to define targets and to understand how you can achieve those targets. So it's a matter of targets and instruments. Uh, this, this is what the boring approach in finance ministries requires you to do. So whenever there is a document which sets out the commitment, say a budget law, sets out the, commit the commitment that the government uh, stands up to in, in any area of policy making, this, these commitments must be observable, measurable, and in order to be assessed. So the first step towards having an inclusive economic policy is to define how you can measure progress in an inclusive policy. We can definitely measure progress in growth, GDP growth. We can definitely achieve uh, measure progress in public finance, all the terrible public finance aggregates like debt, like deficit and all that story, or other areas like banks. Oops, I mentioned banks. Um, but this must be extended to uh, indicators that uh, imply a, an inclusive growth approach. So that has to do with environment sustainability, exclusion, childcare, access to education, and the like. Uh, the Italian government has just approved an official list of 12 indicators that as of next year, this year we have done it on an experimental limited uh, pattern, as of next year will be explicit part on the, of the uh, medium term planning of the economic policy of the government, <coughs> which uh, will be uh, addressed and evaluated just as much as finance, public finance variables will be addressed and evaluated. So this is not just an academic exercise because these numbers are part of the policy commitments of the government. They have to be approved by parliament and they have to be assessed, exposed by parliament uh, when time is, is run off between one statement and the final statement. So this is one aspect uh, which shows how using the Italian example, economic policies can be made consistent in practice to the global economic statements about making growth inclusive. The second point is about gender. And the second, the second new element in the policy documents and commitments uh, which have been introduced by the Italian government uh, this year is gender budgeting. In other words, the point is simply stated. What are the impacts of individual measures, be they spending measures, taxation measures, transfer, whatever, not just on growth and income, but on gender, in terms of uh, young and uh, less young, male and female, and so forth. Of course, this is, on the one hand, already achieved uh, and implemented in some countries, and on the other hand, difficult to implement in practice because not always it is possible, technically speaking, uh, identifying specific policy instruments which have a bearing on the target. I, uh, w what I'm interested in is the final target, it's not the instrument, but I need an instrument. I need a car to get somewhere. I'm not interested in the car, but I'm interested in the final destination, but without a car I don't get there. So I need to establish a link between instruments and target. This is the second element which has been introduced. Will it work? Well, I hope so, but in any case, the next finance ministers will come here and answer the question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Minister. Do you have time for five minutes for questions or? No? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. If I may, I have uh, two questions for you. The first is about the fact that there are two trends in the European economy. The first one is, let's say, the digital and the entrepreneurial economy. And the second one is the environmental issues that are bringing new solution to, to Europe. How do you put that in your economic policy in your country and how do you see the role of Europe in this, uh, in this, this area? And the second question is about gender because we see that many countries has laws and regulation to have gender equality and we don't reach the target. So do you think that we have to do more than only laws and regulation and what could we do to have a better parity in companies, in political system and uh, everywhere so a woman can be part of the decision making? Well, two big questions. I don't think I need five hours, uh, <laughs> not just five minutes. Uh, well, as far as the first question is concerned, I will, I will hide myself behind a very general statement. Uh, Europe is growing at a rate which is not satisfactory, although it's, it's not that bad. But looking forward over the next several uh, decades, uh, Europe should uh, remind itself that Europe is one of the leading economies of the world. We are an economy as Europe at the frontier of innovation. And I'm one of those who believe that innovation is good. It's not a problem. It, often it is said that innovation destroys jobs. This may be the case. By the way, there is evidence it will destroy many economists' jobs, which <laughs> could, be a good news, could be good news. Uh, but it will create many more jobs we are not even aware of today because we are not able to understand the skills of, say, 10 years from now. So we are living in a world of exciting transformation. We should ride the waves, not just go back home uh, to the beach and swim back. We just should ride the waves, understanding that there is no other option available. Uh, otherwise, Europe will shrink, will close itself, will do the opposite of what needs to be done. So innovation uh, has to be at the heart of policy. Uh, the environment is a big challenge which requires innovation as a, an approach to deal with the environment problems. When I was at the OECD, immediately after the breakout of the financial crisis in 2008, one of the things that the OECD set on the table was we must respond to the financial crisis which has generated a deep recession by being proactive in terms of green growth. We need to find new sources of growth and we need to find it in the green domain. So we need to redesign economic policies to bring at the same time innovation and environment friendly outcomes. This is possible exactly because technology is so fantastically speeding up that I'm convinced that even in some probability there are response, technical responses that can be implemented. And this brings me to the second point which has to do with innovation but also gender policy. Uh, basically, uh, it is the duty of policymakers to choose. To choose what? Among feasible solutions. And usually, when you find a problem, there are technical solutions to the problem of I want to go in that direction rather than in this direction. I want to have more gender inclusion rather than less gender inclusion. You can design tax policies, you can design incentives, you can design spending in ways that are consistent with your targets. In many cases, the issue is not whether you can technically achieve it. In many cases, it's whether you want politically to achieve it, given the fact that political constraints are very heavily weighing down on what the policymaker can do. And so, basically, I'm, as you all know, probably looking at the Italian debate. I'm supposed to be a technical minister, but um, I, I think that policymaking is also very important. <laughs>